Hello, and welcome back to Jack's Coffee Break. My name is Jack, this is my coffee break. So this is going to be part of our build series, but we are specifically on episode three of talking about habitats. The basics, the way that we can sort of elevate a habitat and um, turn it into something that has appeal for us. Um, in the first episode, we talked about what the bare requirements for the habitat system is. In the last episode, which was episode two, we talked about our guest and staff facing areas. So we created these little guest nooks out of the organic shape um, that we accidentally created, uh, accidentally on purpose. In the first episode, last episode, um, we spruced these up, made them a little bit more appealing to live in. We didn't take it completely to the nth degree, you know, we just shaped the area, put down some some ideas of what we want, you know, some foliage, some screening plants. Um, and then we redid our um, shelter building for our animals. And we put our staff buildings on top of the shelter building inside of the uh, inside of the habitat, just to show that that is in fact possible. This episode, however, we are going to talk about different ways so that you can contain your animals without needing to construct barriers from the construction tab. So there are multiple ways to do this. Um, however, the main ones that I wanna look at today are going to be rock work. So this is going to be everything contained in the natures and rock section, reset. Uh, let's get rid of blueprints, there we go. So all of the stuff that is in this tab right here in the nature rock tab. And then we are also going to be talking about using elevation and height in order to create more visual interest and to contain your animals. So let's go ahead and get started with some, some basics that we want to do. So because this is a sample universe, I've literally just started it for this series, we have a couple of copies of this habitat. Again, last episode we talked about blueprinting and so if we decide that we don't like what we do here, we can always try something different on these other ones. Uh, however, since today we are going to be focusing on different ways that you can manipulate a habitat, let's go ahead and let's remove this staff path because I want to show you how to use elevation specifically to contain your animals. So of course, when we look in the Zoopedia, for our animals specifically, we have our African wild dog and we have our Aldabra tortoise. Uh, the Aldabra tortoise was an accident, but they're getting along great. So, yeah, they seem to like each other. They're, they're happy. So we're not too worried about them. But for these animals, um, we know that they have specific height requirements. So boundary requirements, uh, grade two, 4.125 feet, which is roughly two meters. Aldabra tortoise, 1.65 feet, that's roughly one meter. So as long as these animals have something containing them that is two meters up or down, they will be contained. In the case of the Aldabra tortoise, it's really more like if there is a bump in the road, they're contained. <laughs> They're very easy, um, but these guys actually can jump. And so we need to be mindful of how far that jump is and how tall we can go. So let's go ahead and get out our terrain, our terrain stamp tool. Um, so let's go ahead and set it to, let's say four meters. And it is four meters submerged into the ground. So it's currently sitting at two meters above. And I'm going to go ahead and place that down right there. Now I'm going to go into sculpting. I'm going to go flatten to terrain, flatten, flatten to foundation. My goodness, I can speak. I definitely haven't recorded three of these in a row. Not at all. I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to put some height here. I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, shape this all the way to the edge of the building. I think just right around there. And then I'm going to use flatten to foundation again just to cut this edge. There we go. And this is why I ended up deleting the path because now when we pull this path downward, we're going to have a new landing pad. And in fact, we can even go into our terrain stamp tool. We can find where this building, the edges. Generally, I, I do this through a lot of using the undo button. That's about where the top is. Because of the fact that we have pathing right here, we're going to get this little dip, but of course we can always remove the pathing and redo it. I think it would be cool if we had a little bridge though. So I'm going to create this little plateau, flatten the foundation, and let's say that there's an entire section of our zoo that's up here. Now let's go ahead and reduce our intensity and use the pull tool. 
in order to just shape this up a little bit. This back side we don't care so much about because we don't know where it's going yet, but this side over here we probably do care about. We definitely want our staff to be able to get into this building. So we need to make sure that there's a path. So one of the ways that we can do this is to get out our ramp tool, flatten to surface, find a nice smooth angle, smooth everything out, and get out a test path. Make sure that we can actually follow it down the hill. Yes, we can. So I, w I do want to talk about what I just did there for a moment. So when I added this little connection, initially it would not let me to connect to this because the terrain was just a little bit too high for the path to for the path to comfortably connect to. And so in order to deal with that, I toggled flatten terrain and it forced it to create this little lip right here that it could land onto. Brought it through this way, removed flattened terrain, and then connected it down this direction. This sometimes works, sometimes it does not. Sometimes you have to spend a while fiddling with it just to get it to work. Other times it behaves itself on the first try. So try your best. Um, and sometimes if you get something to work and you've been fiddling with it for a while and it doesn't look good, but it's functional, sometimes it might be easier to just build around what you have than trying to make it look perfect. Pathing really is one of those nightmare situations. Double checking on the inside and everything's looking good. So now we have this edge here. Let's go ahead and remove our barrier from this area just along this edge. Let's turn this null. And now let's go check with our dogs and see if they can climb over this. Once it adjusts, we see that no, they can't. We get this rougher edge, it's no longer as clean, but they can't jump over this space. There's no exit for them. So we know that we've used the right height. However, this edge, it doesn't look very clean, does it? I don't necessarily like it. And the other thing is that we have this nice little steeple area, but we don't seem to be doing anything with it. And of course our third and uh, our third thing to consider is that we have no natural water sources. Now sometimes this doesn't matter, especially if you're building in a dry area. Um, oftentimes it doesn't matter if your animal doesn't have a water requirement. Neither the dogs nor the Aldabra tortoise have any kind of water requirement for their habitat. So adding it would be purely as a water source and for our own enrichment. But let's say that for the sake of filling out this area, that we do want to have some kind of water source. One of the main reasons why we might consider doing something like that is because if we look at the foliage allowances for these animals, we see that just from decorating this space alone, we're already at 3% coverage. Any object that crosses over the barrier and into the habitat space is counted, even if it's at half percentages. For example, this alpine, not even gonna try that, it's at 0%, but it just barely crosses over, so it matters. We can adjust these so that way they're outside of the barrier line, or we can just accept this. And since the coverage is so low, we're not going to be able to rely on plants in order to make this area look good. So we're going to have to work on our rock work, and we're going to have to add other features. Hence, I think it's probably a good idea for us to add a water source, and for us to talk about the terrace tool. So water in this game is finicky. I think we, we all probably know that by now. The, ter the terrace tool was added a few patches back in order to help make uh, building shallow water areas a little bit easier. So in this case, I'm going to go into my terrain ter uh, flatten to terrace tool. I'm going to make sure that my shallow pool offset is on. I'm gonna have a low intensity. I'm gonna have a small size. And I'm going to set my terrace height to one. And now I'm going to test it. So we get kind of this deep little pool through here, but considering how far out of our barrier we are, I don't mind this. Let's go ahead and bring this to the edge. We're watching our mesh lines to make sure that we don't accidentally crack anything. There we go. I want to bring this as close to an edge as I possibly can. We're gonna test our water, and this is our water line. Let's go ahead and remove that. Let's remove the shallow pool offset. Let's go right up to this top area. There we go. And now we have this clean edge right through here. The water is not throwing up any errors, so I'm going to accept it. Next, let's repeat down here. Let's make sure that we have our shallow pool offset. I wanna make sure to pull right up to this edge, but no farther. Turn off my shallow pool offset, bring it right there, add my water. Oh, our African wild dogs are about to mate. Oh, we missed it, but that's okay. Are we gonna get puppies? <gasps> no puppies. That's okay. 
we have a little bit to go. So now let's go ahead and bring the water through here. Now, because of the fact that we have our poor, long suffering Aldabra tortoise, I don't want to make this water very deep simply because I wanna make sure that that tortoise can cross over it. So we're going to keep using our, our terrace tool. Let's bring it over here. Oh, let's make sure we have our shallow pool offset. That might be useful. And I think I want it to come this direction. Now let's test. There we go. That looks like a nice little waterway. I think we can probably even make it thinner. I'm gonna go ahead and turn auto paint on so that way I know what I've done. There we go. I think I want it to curve this way a little bit more. There we go. I think I like that. Alrighty, now let's go ahead and remove this water. And let's go ahead and show off the opposite of what we've done here. And let's go ahead and create a ledge through here. So I'm going to go into terrain. And honestly for this, I find that the easiest thing is to just take your push tool, push down the ground until you feel like that's probably enough. Go to your flattened to terrain. There we go. And now we just want to run along the edge of this barrier. There we go. Now I am leaving this little space right here because I don't necessarily want all of this to be flat. And in fact, I kind of want more of this to be flat through here. So let's do something like that. Now we need to test our water again and we are not getting an error. But I think it's worth asking, considering what we're looking at here, why are we not getting an error? It's because we have this barrier here. We are using the corrugated. It's not climbable and it's not watertight. For some reason, it is accepting that this is okay. I'm gonna go ahead and remove the water from this. We're gonna go ahead and take this barrier. We're gonna make it null. And we're gonna find out what this does to our water. And it is not letting us do that. So at this point, we have three barrier options. We have undulating, we have flat top, and we have flat top and editable bottom. So these three things do very different tasks in terms of our barriers. When we make an undulating barrier, what it's saying is that these posts are always going to be two meters tall or whatever height that we set the initial barrier at. When we go to flat top, what we're saying is that no matter where I start, no matter what the terrain does, I want you to keep this as flat as humanly possible. Flat top and editable bottom does the same thing as flat top, except that this bottom post is going to undulate. So since we have it selected, let's go ahead and go to flat top, editable bottom. And now when we look at this, we have this new little down arrow. We have this whole selection through here and we click this down arrow and it gives us this massive red error. And this is because of a glitch in the game that is asking the barrier to hit something like 40 meters below the surface. And of course it's not gonna do that. I don't know why this glitch continues to persist in the game. Unfortunately, what you have to do in order to get this thing to work is you have to either select this entire section and gently move it, or you can go through and you can drag each post individually. It is exactly as time consuming as it sounds. Now, when we hit null, it, part it behaves itself. Let us once again, check our water line. It's said that this is okay because we flooded the area. Let's go ahead and go to our flattened foundation and let's get our smallest option. Let's get like a one or a two. Sometimes one is too small. And now we're just going to pull this edge. Now let's test. Almost. This is where we're having our water gap. There we go. And it's behaved. And lastly, let's go ahead and finish creating our look. And now, of course, we need to double check with our dogs and see whether or not they can escape. So now we see that we have three points of egress. These are areas where the terrain is just either outside of the barrier enough that they can escape or that we've had a dip and they can escape to a new height. So let's go ahead, flatten the foundation since that's the simplest option. Make sure that we shore up these corners. We've made it easier on them. That's okay. So we have shortened this area. We've smoothed everything out. And of course, one of the issues that we were running into is that the dogs can now jump off this ledge. But the other thing that we need to consider is that we're now going to add in a whole bunch of water effects and we have these rough edges through here. Now, I will be the first to say that terrain mesh does not look very pretty. 
And of course, a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's angular. It is operating on a set of grids and calculating angles, and it doesn't look very organic. It's not going to. So this is the point where I would suggest that we frame our edges of our cliffs. And this is why we want to use the rock work. So let's go into nature. And like I said, either this episode or our last episode, I don't remember at this point. I've, again, I've been recording these back to back. So the color or the biome or whatever of the, of the rocks specifically does not matter to the animals. I could do up this entire area in snow and it would not matter. What does matter is that these count as solid objects for the purposes of terrain and for, uh, movement, for movement. So these can either act as obstacles or they can act as places for our dogs to walk. So that's something else that's important that we need to consider. So in this case, what I would like to do is I would like to frame these edges. And I think that I'm actually going to use the savanna. It's a different color than what our biome would normally ask of us. However, it can be very pretty if we blend all of these different colors together. So sometimes it's nice to work with rocks that don't have anything to do with your current palette. It's often easier to work with colors that are adjacent to your palette, but today I feel like being bold. And plus it makes it easier for you to see. I think that this is probably a good rock. So the first thing that I wanna do is I want to acknowledge that this is going to be our waterfall. So let's go ahead and frame that. There we go. That looks acceptable. And then we'll deal with this once we get the effects in. At this point, I have this whole edge to do, I have this edge to do, and I have this edge to do. Now I can sit here and I can manually tweak and turn and spin and all of these different things. Or alternatively, I can come down here to the random rotation button and I can turn that on. And now, if I know that I want to keep this a similar height, and it took us next to no time. So this can be a wonderful time saver. If you're willing to not have full control over what direction your rocks are going or what they're going to look like in the end. Again, we don't really care about this back edge. We have no idea where it's going. Now, the last thing to note about when we do this is that we've now changed where our dogs can move within this area. It means that this border is no longer up to date. So let's go ahead and highlight our dog again. And this entire area should now be an escape point. Correct. The way that we deal with this is to go into our barriers. I'm going to select this entire section. And for our purposes, I'm going to delete it. Now I want to be very clear about something. When you do this in franchise mode with a potentially dangerous animal, it's going to cause a brief error where the game assumes that an animal has escaped. See, we're going to get this habitat has become invalid. It's going to assume that this animal has escaped. When you unpause the game, it's going to take a moment to recalculate what happened and where your animals are able to move again. And during that time, it is possible that your guests are going to panic and flee. So if you don't have to, I recommend not doing this. However, since I don't have any guests and we're currently in an example, I'm going to take the easy way. So now let's go double check with our dog. His boundary has been updated and now we have a new symbol. We have this mesh and up. And this means that this is a point where he can, es he can escape through jumping. There are a couple of ways that you can deal with this. Uh, the first of course is to just make the area shorter. The second, er the second way is to make these rocks taller, so that way he has a farther way to jump. The third way, if you have the aquatic pack, I like to use these aquatic rocks. Let's make them just a little bit more orange for our area. There we go. Sink them in. We've got random rotation going. And make these little pads of pebbles and rocks. These are just pointy enough that for the most part, most animals cannot walk on them. So now we're gonna double check with our dog and it has removed the issue. Our dog can no longer jump out of this area. So we have used minimum barriers. We only have this little section of actual barrier left that our mechanic can actually repair. We can now replace this with some of the barriers that we already have. 
and otherwise we've made a completely natural habitat. The dogs are safe, they can't get in and out, the tortoise is safe, he can't get in and out, and on top of that we've defined a whole extra area for ourselves to build should we want to continue with this and make it an actual zoo. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm gonna pause, and I'm going to finish up this barrier and then we will wrap up. There we go. Alrighty. So today we focused a little bit on rock work, a couple of the tools that you can use to make rock work just a little bit easier, framing your edges and using height and elevation to create natural barriers for your animals. And of course, using those opportunities for height and elevation to add more interest to your zoo as a whole and to help you develop new areas. We also talked about ways that you can use rocks such as the aquatic gravel in order to block animals' ability to move around areas and ways that you can use rock work to increase their traversable space. So I hope that this was helpful. We are definitely making some massive progress on this habitat. It's looking really good. Again, by the end of the first episode, this was what we had. And just by finding little opportunities in this shape, we've managed to expand it into something that's starting to look pretty amazing. <laughs> like it's really coming along. It looks like an actual habitat. So next week, um, we are going to be finally focusing on the inside of this habitat. We're going to be getting down some foliage. We're going to be dealing with our terrain painter and making that work for ourselves. Um, and we will be talking about ways that you can use rock work instead of foliage in order to add more interest to areas, especially when you're dealing with animals who don't want a single plant in their habitat. So I hope that you will join us for that. And I hope that this was useful for you. Otherwise, have a great day and happy building. Thank <laughs> you.